Monkey Brain Monk, WAFT Champagne 90.1 on your FM dial. Dave on the board. This is Sunday, January the 21st, um, 2018. And this is the Prairie Monk Show, WEFT's weekly look at the environment, rails, trails, greenways, melting snow, drizzle, fog, and all the other sorts of stuff that we get this time of year in East Central Illinois. A couple of uh, extraneous things here. Uh, first of all, I, I have been looking for a, a clamp that clamps your cell phone so that you can tie it onto a, a tripod. So if you wanted to cover something for something more than 10 minutes, you can't really hold your camera still in your hand, so you need a tripod and you need to be able to connect the camera some. So this is a little device, and it uh, is very, very helpful. And uh, so uh, uh, you have to look for it in the camera departments, not in the uh, cell phone departments. One doesn't seem to note the other one. So just look around, and if it, the answer is no, you might look at somewhere else. But it's the sort of thing that can fit, fit into your pocket, and uh, is very handy, and it's part of the cell phone era. Second thing I want to comment on is the, the state decides after you have had uh, license plates and you have a little uh, sticker to, to go on, eventually you get 10 stickers there, <laughs> and that's enough. Uh, they all come off at once. Uh, so the state gives you a new license plate. But uh, when you do that, uh, the bolts that hold your license plate oh, on rusted. have rusted like crazy. And I just wonder how many people in Illinois are having a, a, a time putting that uh, plate on. They, they give you a little sticker, which is a T sticker, and that indicates that you have paid your license fee and you have your plates because you've got to get them on. You'd think that they would just send you a tiny little scraper, a really sharp little knife, to just take off the entire stack of 10 that were already there, and you start yes. fresh. And uh, it's, so I've had friends and relatives out there helping to, to uh, instate my new plates. And they'll accumulate another little battery of uh, stickers on the top right-hand corner. Uh, those two things. Well... We have to say farewell to the Pocket Prairie. Oh. The, the uh, Pocket Prairie has been there for over 30 years, uh, and the building to which it is a, a part has uh, been leased, and uh, we have to get out of there. So once again, I've had quite a bit of help from uh, Rich Cahill, Al Fredericks, uh, Billy Allenwell and others uh, to, to get out of there and provide parking space for the new tenants. It will be a restaurant and uh, a, a local brewery, and uh, we really do wish them well. We thank them for the, the uh, years that we've had. Uh, Smile Politely has a, an article on, and, and the News Gazette also has an article on what it, it will be the intent. The building has been empty for quite some time, and we've been glad to have a pocket prairie there. It's quite amazing. I went to the eye doctors, and, and I met up with Jay, and Jay called me over, and, uh, and I, I had to ask where I had encountered him, and he said, oh, I was on the construction crew that was putting in sidewalks outside your place, and we had a tour of the Pocket Prairie, and I've never really forgotten that. And so we talked, and then uh, he, I asked him where, what he was doing now, and he, he's working for Clifford, Clifford Jacobs, which is a, um, 
uh, an organization that uh, makes uh, blocks for vehicles. Uh, they do molten steel and, and pour blocks. And then we happen to have a warehouse that is where they used to uh, sandblast off the the uh, glitches that were on the the castings. Uh, so just just meeting people and talking, uh, find out what they do and why and how, and uh, that, that that has been a part of the uh, little pocket prairie. Let me give you some history. Uh, the pocket prairie had two. 30-foot signs there, very, very, very large signs. And University Avenue happens to be a federal highway, and using Lady Bird Johnson interests, the, the uh, uh, that was grandfathered in for 10 years. Grandfathering means that if that if you've been up with a rule that uh, has changed, uh, the Congress has changed it, or some other body has changed it, then you get to, to have your old rule for 10 years, and then there's a change. So you, you don't come into it suddenly, you, you get time to change it. Well, these two 30-foot signs went down to one, probably about a 12 by 12 at the end of the corridor. The, the resulting battle axe prairie uh, it was a, a weedy patch and uh, an awkward patch. It's uh, uh, it's like the battle axe means that you, the building that is attached to is like the axe and the, the handle is, is where the awkward spot is. Uh, we figured that we could uh, put our own weeds in there instead of having sort of urban weeds. And uh, we asked Dr. Youngerman, who owns the, ter the, the territory, if we could do that, and the answer was yes. It uh, would probably save him quite a bit in terms of having to mow it or deal with the weeds. Uh, we uh, uh, brought in some... Uh, Silversberry trees, and the silversberries are like a, a huge shrub. They simulate the forest part of the prairie forest ecosystem without having roots enough that they can lift up a building. Uh, and, and they became the, the simulated forest of the prairie forest ecosystem. Uh, it, we put in understory herbs in that area so that before the canopy greens over in spring, we have uh, understory herbs. There's a shrub lady there. Um, uh, the, the shrubs are dogwood and basically uh, uh, I'm trying to think of it. It's a, a legume too, uh, and it's uh, not. Bl bl uh, I can't think of the main. It's a legume that, uh, and that's spice bush and others that are understory herbs. There are uh, vines that crawl through the the layers of the forest, and uh, then there's the forest itself, which has a, an edge timber where you can move out and you can realize that the animals that fossil in the prairie would come back to the forest like a big grove uh, to uh, nest, to be protected, uh, to uh, sometimes find berries and fruit, but they roam out into the prairie, which is rather wet and not really a good habitat for, for nesting. Uh, there was a, a nice little path through, put in by Boy Scouts, and uh, there's a, a simulated moraine. You have to know that uh, the landscape uh, was moranic, 
a moraine means that there's a glacier, a continental glacier comes down to that point with that particular temperature and might remain there for a thousand years and it's gradually coming forth from uh, places like the Laurentian Shield in Canada and dropping gravel and then when the world warms that glacier t goes back and leaves a uh, a lump of gravel and till uh, if, if it if the world gets colder then the glacier will move south so there are people who are specialists who know the age of these moraines and know the uh, content and where they came from and what uh, till and the rubble is in them. Uh, some of them are more uh, rich in s soil or till uh, than others. Uh, the last glaciation was the Wisconsin and the uh, uh, prior to that was the Illinoisan, not quite as, as rich in soil. Uh, so we have a little spot where you can imagine a moraine with different sorts of rocks, some of them some are sedimentary, some of them are basaltic, uh, very mixed and very rich. Uh, still might be in the forested area or in the prairie area. Yeah, we just had it at the edge. In front of the glacier there's always a a wet spot where all the glacial waters are melting uh, at a certain temperature where the glaciers uh, settle down. And uh, so we have a wetland and, and then species like uh, ironweed and, and others that like that particular spot. We also know that there are species that like the edge timber. They like to be near some shade. Most of the prairie plants are perennial and they uh, like a lot of sunlight. So you see a little prairie had about 50 uh, plants, different species in there. Uh, it reduced to about 30 because uh, the soil we have on that little battle axe shaped plot is landfill. It's <laughs> It's brick bats and glass and, and all sorts of things that don't amount to good glacial soils. So some of the more elegant species that we had there have disappeared gradually. We also have urban rabbits and other creatures that like to eat our prairie. We don't have a fence around it in the sense of having each species blocked off with a, a wire cage. You know, we just are li living with the environment we have in downtown. We do have birds. We have cardinals that have two families a year. We have uh, finches, uh, goldfinches that seem to like the seed that we have. Uh, and it's amazing. We have uh, sometimes cooper hawks, which will take out a dove uh, because the dove moves fairly slowly and the cooper's hawk can move fast. We have night jars that uh, you can hear them coming down with their mouth open and they're collecting insects as they dive down and you can and then they turn back up. We have Canada geese. We have a couple of, uh, that are, they, they mate for life. So uh, they uh, have a nest on the you know, pedestal of the water tower which is a little bit further north. But they come as a pair and they sit on the buildings next door and they talk to each other and go on. <laughs> and off they fly to some other location. Uh, then they come back with their family. And you don't get between them and their chickens <laughs> or you, you're in strife. Uh, they are big enough a, a bird that they can uh, land on your back and, and, and and flap their wings and you're sorry for it. Uh, so then there are also the uh, m more voluminous uh, groups of uh, 
Canada geese that come. You can see them flying around in a V-shaped corridor. And you have one uh, goose breaking the air, and then that will change. Somebody else will take the, the lead situation. And uh, that's a way of moving through the air and, and sampling the, the thermals and, and finding ponds. It used to be that the Canada geese would go further south, but these days they're staying around. They're very annoying to, to some people, especially people who have ponds, because they are prone to drop droppings uh, it's just everywhere. And a little bit like the crows. Uh, the crows that were over there the other night, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crows and they were, uh, on our trees in, in the prairie, but they were also lined up on the railroad station roof. <laughs> uh, crows are pretty intelligent creatures. And uh, they, they uh, select a tree for the night and that's it. And afterwards, you have a whole lot of guano. So we've talked about the city having the, to wash the pavement uh, after the uh, crows have used two trees as a, a rookery. Uh, so we have that too. <laughs> and, uh, and right now, there's, there's a whole bunch of guano over on the little prairie. Uh, so there was a trail. Now you have come through the... Uh, edge timber. There's a little area for people to meet and sit and enjoy, and that's been used over the years uh, uh, a lot, and people remember it. And the trail goes around and drops down. The, the area was terraced so that the 30-foot um, signs had a, an elegant base. And that provides an opportunity to plant uh, prairie plants. Mostly we pr planted plants rather than seeds because seeds take five, ten years sometimes to grow. And uh, so we had and have right today uh, the litter provided by the big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, and cord grass. And, uh, you can look over the fence to a, a little plot that f faces Chester Street, and uh, there's a, a whole bunch of uh, prairie. Right now it's uh, in winter time, and uh, it looks like a, a, a dead site. Not too exciting for people who are used to horticultural flowers that have eventually been bred from the like of prairie plants, but the prairie plants uh, flower for a short time or smaller. Uh, they have interesting uh, fruiting bodies, and the baptisia there is uh, has its fruiting bodies. They're empty because the insects know that this is a legume and this is a healthy food. And uh, uh, so uh, we have a, I haven't ever done a, a sampling of the insects, but we certainly do have a lot of insects, mm -hmm. including pollinators and bumblebees. Bumblebees come and they have saddlebags. They stuff uh, pollen into their saddlebags. They, they find nectar in the flowers like bee balm. Uh, and mint that is favored by pollinators. Uh, we have lead plant and uh, indicator plants that the indicator a uh, halfway season prairie. So even specialists enjoy this little prairie. It uh, has allowed us to introduce people to the prairie that have not known what a prairie is. Uh, I came from Australia and I could not find the ecosystem and I found it mostly along railroad beds and in vacant places like uh, cemeteries that haven't been mown and uh, in corners of fields that, where you couldn't turn a, a, a team of horses. Uh, it's, uh, it's there but it's point one percent. It's, it's 0.01% that's, that's remaining that is original prairie. 
So people are planting prairies, and so this also inspires people to plant them. If you can plant them on a, a landfill on next to Goose Lake Pond and and uh, have a prairie downtown, the Goose Lake Pond that doesn't exist anymore, but that's sort of where it was. And and uh, you can stand back and take a photograph of a lead plant that's three feet high and, and with the MTD building in the background. So there are people who specifically like to plant, to, to photograph the prairie with the buildings in the background. They're sort of amazed that this is a, a, an odd spot in downtown Champaign, which actually uh, gives the street some uh, character. Uh, we do have people who use it alternatively. We have some people who drink beer or uh, sleep there or uh, roller skate on the, <laughs> the building next door or even die there. Mm. And, and uh, so you have homeless people who like to use the site in the summer when it's cool and the, the forest part of the prairie is, is shaded. Uh, but there are also pernicious people who do things like take the copper out of the uh, commercial air conditioners behind the building, and that costs you $3,000 to replace the, the copper for which they would probably get some $5 or $10. Uh, but uh, without watching it all the time, there are dozens and hundreds of people who've come back. Uh, children bring their parents. Their parents bring their children. Uh, they sit there and read the paper. They read a book. They, they uh, are just enjoy the site, which, which demonstrates its usefulness as a pocket prairie in, in a downtown. Uh, there are places like Chicago where they try to do this sort of purposefully. They don't put the buildings up to the street level like there are buildings on University Avenue that have very little set of setback and very little room for a tree or, or a space to think. Uh, and what space is left is right adjacent to University Avenue and all the traffic. Uh, so this is a quiet spot. And one that's enjoyed, sometimes violated, you have to have someone nearby who will be out there with a flashlight at 12 o'clock at night and, and give field trips so that at least the people who are there, smoking a joint or something like that. Uh, but there's another reason for this little spot to be in, uh, preserved. Uh, we have to deal with uh, policemen who who have uh, take care of these sorts of things and and especially if there's people sleeping there uh, so this is a, there's a gang and a yang to this little prairie we have it fairly well documented uh, but uh, it's it will be sad to see it go uh, the uh, area is being uh, Looked at by a lot of people, uh, can we have some development which would include a prairie plant or a, or a little spot? Uh, possibly not, uh, but uh, if you go to Smile Politely or to the News Gazette, you can find some of the details because the people are, uh, I think, coming in from Peoria and uh, they uh, are going to let people know what they're doing and uh, so that will be rather interesting. Uh, we have to thank Dr. Youngman profusely for letting us have the site for 30 years. Uh, we have to thank Tom Pantham and other managers for Dr. Youngman's Coons uh, clothing store and other buildings but they have been interested too uh, and very helpful and we've had parking on this end of it so uh, that's what we'll have to get out of now surprisingly this week we had or last week 
we had a big class of architects. These are senior students, and uh, I, ju I just happened to look out and see uh, a, a bunch of probably 20 or so, 30 students, and I asked them if they would like a field trip. <laughs> I'm always doing that. And uh, yes, and I think they were kind of amazed. Uh, they have to th also think about gentrification and fitting little nooks and crannies in here and there that make uh, a, a city interesting. Uh, so I, I took them on field trips. It was cold, it was icy, it was sloppy, it was, <laughs> it was snowy, but the, the, the plants were there in their winter array. And if you're a prairie nut, you can see the big blue stem dropping down like a, a bundle of skittles. You can see the winter reaction. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. But for people who are not used to uh, looking with that sort of curiosity, this looks like a, a weedy mess in winter. Most park districts take all their flowers out at the end of the season, so it's bare soil. This is not bare soil. This has got all those plants and some creatures too that are in that location. Uh, the piece that uh, the, when you walk around the the piece that it owned, is owned by Dr. Youngerman, there's a piece that's owned by the Pope family on the other side, and and you can look over and see rotten weed and coreopsis and. Uh, Baptizia and uh, little blue stem lined up in a line along a, a very formal planting. But it's a, a, a little blue stem is a quite a di diplomat. There's a, there's a, a big uh, prairie dock there. It probably has a, if allowed to do so, it probably has a 10 foot root and it shoots up its fruiting body at least 10 feet. And that's a problem because it has been, a, uh, it violates the dignity of uh, the uh, uh, smaller volume uh, advertising side on the uh, side above the prairie. So we have to, to prune it, unfortunately. Sometimes it gets left, uh, the, the sign has re been removed now. So this year the, the prairie dock has been able to express itself. And actually someone with a um, man lift has been able to house the seed from the top. Uh, just uh, overall in interesting things happen. And we can even sometimes, uh, some of our prairie plants like uh, cup plant get to be a little on the weedy side. So you have to manage the prairie in a small plot. If it was out there in the 10,000 acres, it would mind its own business and be controlled by the creatures and animals. And uh, But if you're in a small plot, you have to control it and we have to reduce the amount of, of uh, cup plant. It's kind of interesting because it has a, uh, leaves that fuse and create a little cup and the rain collects it in the cup, and you could do 10 PhD theses on what goes on in the little cup, uh, paramecium and all sorts of other creatures in there. Yeah. So it's an interesting plant, but it also is a fairly aggressive plant. Tall Coryopsis is a t uh, fairly aggressive. So the ones that we have survived, about 30 species, are uh, <laughs> the strong, elements of the, of the prairie, or the ones that have a, can survive in that habitat. It, uh, uh, we can even have some prairie smoke and, and, and a few other more sophisticated species uh, if we can provide them with a habitat that's like unto the nature. Uh, you can go around once and be surprised. You can climb through a, a an, a, a grapevine, um, a prairie grapevine, which is uh, at the base is, is, is three inches across. It has grown large, it grows into the tree, uh, and uh, I purposely leave it there uh, 
uh, so, so that people can have to crawl through it and they have to ask, what what is this thing? Uh, and uh, just recently, as uh, in preparation for uh, the future, it was taken out, and uh, uh, so you can now walk very directly uh, through that corridor without having climbed through the grapevine. But it, it was serving its purpose in its day. It actually has nice little grapes. They're very, very bitter. <laughs> so you don't eat them very easily, but you could. Uh, you got to wonder a little bit if you're eating something from the, the pocket prairie because the roots are, are into a landfill and you don't exactly know what's in the landfill, but uh, kind of fun. Uh, some of it leans over the fence. Uh, some of that causes problems. We had a, a, a nice... Uh, lead plant right on the fence line and it would poke its nose through the, the fence and uh, then it would get herbicided. So uh, people who herbicide and clean up their side of the fence don't always realize that this has, the, the herbicide is uh, a uh, systemic herbicide. So that herbicide goes right down into the root. So we, we lost a very nice uh, lead plant there. It's kind of interesting that it, it's found its photographic way onto a, a CD. The mean lids have it on their CD as a, 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 a as a uh, cover shot. And uh, other uh, groups have, have put uh, uh, bits and pieces of the of the pocket prairie on their CDs. Uh, uh, you can you can see it in the morning. You can see it at noon. You can see it at uh, at sunset, and you can see it at night. So I give field trips with a with a flashlight, and you can see at least some of the prairie at night and get a feeling for it. There are things that there are nocturnal insects, for instance, at night that you don't see during the day. Uh, there are mice. There are rabbits. <laughs> we, 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 the urban uh, territories have become our own natural areas because once you go out of town, uh, it's all corn and soybeans. So we really don't have any habitat for prairies left. What prairies are left are often in town. There's a Meadowbrook Prairie or, or uh, the... Uh, Weaver Prairie or, or uh, Reconstruction Prairies, and, and they're very good. They pr not only uh, look like a prairie and act like a prairie, they may not have 110 species in them, but they surely give creatures an, a feeling that they're at home. This is a prairie, and uh, the people who plant those prairies often start off with a very simple prairie the grasses that grow and look good and, and they wave their wooden leg in the, in the, in the uh, wind and you can see the wind riffle across them. So the grasses are, are often thought of as a prairie but they're like 110 uh, broadleaf species here. And we don't have them all because Champaign County was a very flat county. And when you have a flat county, you don't have a lot of variety for habitat. You, uh, if you were in the Ozarks, and you have to have wetland and nooks and crannies and sh shade and, and, and rocks, then you can have 400 species because... Uh, there's that variety. There's bare rocks that have lichens and mosses on them. Little spots of water, little waterfalls here and there that are intermittently only there when it rains. Sometimes they're permanently. So these this range of uh, of uh, habitat we don't have in Champaign County. We have to go to Vermilion County, Piatt County. DeWitt County. These are all counties that have some terrain. And uh, uh, so uh, 
we try to simulate that as best we can. Uh, we can't burn this prairie. This, in most uh, land-based ecosystems need to be burned. Yeah. Early settlers came and they put a, uh, they had a smoke, smoky the bear and they taught people how to protect uh, uh, prairies and forests and other ecosystems from fire. And that's been a very uh, wrong thing to do. Uh, what happens is that the litter that's usually burned by lightning strikes or or sparks here and there, uh, that usually results in a quick, gentle fire. You, you, you will have a clump of big blue stem and you'll get red in the face if you're too near and if you've got the camera, you, it'll, it'll melt your... Uh, the, the, the chemicals that join your lenses together. Uh, so uh, you have some heat, but it's very short time and it goes. There's not awfully a lot of uh, smoke with it either. Uh, that's probably if you do it at the right time of the year when there's, there's not a lot of uh, green uh, material. If you Once you get green material, you, you're getting to... Uh, have a, a problem with smoke. But we can't do that in that little pocket prairie, so we have to give it a haircut each year. And you don't have to do it every year, but uh, then you, uh, there's a whole bunch of people that have to uh, get to know what the plants are, because the plants do just look like weeds, and it's very easy to take down a, a piece of uh, a uh, lead plant that might have been there for 30 years, uh, not realizing that, no, we don't get rid of that sort of shrubby creature. It's there as part of the scenery, so people learn that way. We also have some uh, invasive, invasive plants, and uh, some of them are like morning glory that wind its way, and so we have people who have to unwind morning glory and take it away. There's, there's also a, a, a vine that's a milkweed that, that can go everywhere. It will invite monarch butterflies and uh, a whole bunch of other butterflies too, but it's it's a weed, and we uh, try to control that. Uh, and we try to c convince people who are just out there because this is ambiance that there's a little bit more than ambiance. Uh, the the architects that came this week were numerous. They were uh, here to to use that as a theoretical spot for putting in a bookstore, and and. Uh, you have to wonder about that uh, as an assignment because <laughs> bookstores have been losing out. We lost a big bookstore in Savoy just recently and, and other bookstores have been having their problems mainly because the internet is, is uh, challenging. They can uh, get a book for less on the internet and there's always a question of is the internet paying the taxes and so we are in an era when we're trying to sort out who pays what for what. And, and you can indeed get your books for less on the internet and that puts bookstores out of business. But bookstores have been changing to media centers. So I wonder what the outcome of this um, class. It must be a fairly large class with, with uh, supervisors and lecturers who are in charge of small groups because they've come through in groups. And you have to know that this little pocket prairie is on Market Street, and Market Street in its day has been a rather raunchy street. And, and it was uh, part of the East Central Illinois mafioso with, with a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, areas where uh, there were bars and uh, brothels and places of interest, perhaps a coffee shop in front, but the starting price breading in, in behind. Uh, people would come to town and stay in places like this uh, or go on to Chicago and, and sometimes drink down their, their earnings uh, and come back. Some would leave... Uh, 
their horses in a uh, stable uh, and the harnesses would be repaired. So just up the road from us there's a, was a 30 bed, 30, three, three story uh, harness factory. The top floor burned so uh, it's now two stories. We don't know quite what will be in the future. Uh, Cofusion has bought that building from News Gazette, and they've also bought the building that's adjacent to the Little Prairie. Uh, so, uh, just very nearby, there was an elevator, and then a red, red line came through on very close to us. Uh, it, it had a uh, uh, early station, uh, so we have photographs of the early trains coming to town. You have a, a railroad plat, which is parallel to the railroad line. The railroaders were given land to put in the railroad, and they were able to sell the land and develop it. So uh, Champaign became a commercial town. It, this railroad did not go through Urbana. We're not quite sure why. Sometimes people didn't want uh, railroads to come through their town. Uh, and, uh, all the steam and, and coal and whatever that goes with it. Sometimes it's the geological situation. Uh, so in early days you had a place where, uh, called a dome house I think, that was uh, on the east side and that's where the engine drivers would stay and the railroaders. Uh, and there, then there was a, an old railroad station, a depot, and it served for quite some time, but in about 1923, uh, that depot was uh, rather cleverly for the era, uh, put on ro rollers and skids and, and pulled up the corridor a little bit. So if you go to the Black Dog Saloon these days, that was the old, old railroad station. In its place, there were in the 1923 fairly large railroad depot, uh, three stories, and uh, that was a, a, a headquarters for a lot of the uh, railroad activities. Uh, uh, the engineers were there. The, uh, if you wanted to, to rent a piece of railroad line uh, for agriculture, you had to go there to get uh, your details. Uh, this was a little bit like relating to uh, Chicago, uh, uh, where there were uh, headquarters, uh, or Memphis. Uh, other places had uh, regional uh, headquarters. but. Uh, uh, and then what they did was they took the railroad line and changed it. Why did they change it? Well, in 1928 you had a lot of trains, but you also had a lot of cars. You had T-Model Fords running around, and you still had horses and buggies and whatever. And there were so many trains that it was getting to be a pain to go to, to University Avenue. And the university had been developed by this time. And, and find you had to wait for a long time to for trains to pass. You 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 having this this day is happening. If you go to Philo, uh, there are so many trains going past that you sometimes have to wait for a long time. It gets very frustrating. So what they did was they had a, a marine at Champ at uh, Paxton, which was uh, the highest uh, hill between Southern Illinois and Chicago. And it was uh, steep enough. Railroads don't go up hills, uh, and they don't go around corners easily. So they, they, they go straight. So this was a fairly straight ra railroad. But when you came to Paxton, you had to have uh, a pusher engine waiting by so that it would help to push the freight cars over the hill. So there were two railroad lines there, one going north-south, one going east-west, the nickel plate going east-west. and. Uh, it was decided to carve a way through that moraine. And where did the soil go? It all came to Champagne, and they created another uh, railroad on the east side of 
the uh, uh, railroad depot. So the line that used to come by just adjacent to the little pocket prairie uh, now was on the other side, and there were uh, four tracks uh, in some places. Uh, there were a lot of trains, and there were a lot of passengers, and this was the only way many people came to, to uh, uh, East Central Illinois. Some came up the rivers when they were uh, at a peak flood and could handle uh, flat bottom boats uh, or canoes and things like that, but many of them came with railroads. Some few of them came by uh, canals, which were almost obsoleted before they got into action. They were obsoleted by rails. And they have continued to some extent in the Illinois River and Mississippi River where they have uh, perhaps 29 locks and dams that, that keep the water high enough for uh, punts and barges to still operate. Uh, it has a lot of controversy to it because it takes out the nature of the river, takes out the waterfalls and the, and the, uh, uh, the regime of, of a, an ecology that's dependent on wet sometimes and dry sometimes. And uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of netters that like to be in, in ripple, ripples or, uh, and, and they hide under stones. They, they collect bacteria with nets and it's rather wonderful. But the commercial side of things means that that river has been channelized. That means uh, you straighten out the curve so you don't have big meanderers that take you a long while to get through. You have uh, cutoffs, and those cutoffs run water fast. But if you have powerful uh, paddle wheels and steamers that can negotiate that, they can get up the river faster than if they had to negotiate the meanders. And you have to know that the meanders cut in at one side, but they have beaches on the other side. And so it's it's very easy to have shoals and sandbars that where you can get, get stuck. So it wasn't easy to get up the, the river or down the river. You had to uh, know about flooding. You had to know that when the Rains, rainy season came, then you're going to have uh, a very rapidly moving river. You could uh, almost have a, a punt that was built uh, to float down the river. You didn't really have to have a, a, a driving force to take it. It, it. You could go down to Memphis and, and, and New Orleans, and there you could just leave the the, the um, punt and take a, a Natchez Trail or uh, back up north and do the same thing again. Uh, and as you got power and uh, you, you could avoid that, and as you put in dams, you could avoid it. So some of our nature has gone in that direction. Uh, in East Central Illinois, we didn't have a river. We have this hang on. But we have watersheds. We have about five watersheds. We have the Kaskaskia, which runs out south of St. Louis. You have uh, the Sangamon, which runs into the Illinois River at Beardstown. You have the Salt Fork, which goes into the uh, Vermilion and, and goes out to the Wabash and to the Ohio. Uh, and north is some rivers that actually move north. Uh, but uh, this was very swampy area. It was flat and uh, involved moraines, the Champaign Moraine, the Bloomington Moraine, the Urbana, uh, Yankee Ridge Moraine, a whole bunch of things. And there was another river there that was the uh, Umbra that took uh, uh, water south and also joined the, the Wabash. Uh, 
So thinking about these things, you can look at the little prairie and let your imagination go forth. And then if you get hooked, we'll take you out to a, a, a real uh, railroad bed where there's preserved uh, natural history and introduce you to a remnant prairie, the, the plants, where the plants are basically what used to be here. They might be invaded by Russian olives or uh, autumn olives, what they're sometimes called, uh, to uh, uh, things like teasel that are uh, a rather interesting um, dried arrangement for cemetery. So if you're near a cemetery, you bet your bottom dollar you're going to have a whole bunch of teasel. So then people get interested in, and they spend years trying to preserve uh, the dignity of this environment. So, uh, the architects started to look around at, at this. Uh, I found out that the, their last assignment had been the uh, preparation of a uh, nature center. So, uh, and others were interested in low-income housing. And so I talked to some of these people, and this is very typical of just how we interact and how they get to know the street, how, how they get to know the butt out, and I don't know what you call it, but on the second floor of buildings like uh, the uh, Seven Saints, there is a little alcove where you can actually sit and look up the river, up the, up the street, and see what's going on. And that was kind of essential in the era of, of the mafioso. You you needed to know who was who and who was what and whether and who was paid off. And he, you could probably have the cops come in one corner and the the, the people go out the other corner. Uh, <laughs> eight or ten buildings different, and they were all interconnected to some extent. By the 50s, uh, this area became a, a center for rotogravure, preparation of the materials for uh, newspapers and production. And uh, the Grubb family was here. They came in about 1956 and occupied land on the uh, Walnut side of the street, but also the uh, Market Street side of the street, and the News Gazette was just up the road, and so you you had linotype machines, click click clack 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 click click clack clack, 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 clack. And, and so you would set uh, uh, lead to represent your letter, whether it's A or a Z, and then you would have journeymen that would put those letters together, and you would have photographs made uh, that were uh, in lead also, and so eventually you'd get a, a frame with your newspaper page up, and you couldn't send that out to everyone, so it was an um, advertisement. You had to then take a mas paper mache copy of it. So we had big presses where the, the paper mache copy was made, and if you were sending it off to Watsika or somewhere else for their paper, their advertising, they had a counterpart machine where they could pour lead into that uh, that form and uh, then print from it. Uh, more sophisticated was the fact that the Grubb family used to uh, prepare uh, graphic material for uh, the medical industry that meant that they had to have uh, very good uh, printing. Uh, they had to have depths of field. They had to, to, if they were printing in color, it had to be the pimple. It had to be the color of the pimple, and not just any old color. And so, uh, and there had to be no glitches. So, you made your letterpress materials, but then you had journeymen that could come with a very tiny little uh, needles and and correct it where it should be corrected. So you had to have proofing presses. So we have one proofing press next door. It weighs 55,000 pounds. It uh, has beams underneath it and on top because it's very, very heavy. Uh, one of them was taken out. This was, there were a pair of these Rolls-Royce printing presses in the 1946. These were uh, state-of-the-art. And they had to take out one of those little uh, 
what you call <laughs> jot outs that you have on the seven saints and put in uh, put this press in on the second floor two of them uh, so you had to have rollers that were very very lo uh, narrow just perhaps a, an inch high and you had to have a crane which lifted this very heavy press up and put it through that window uh, with only a, a couple of inches to spare so uh, one of those presses was taken out it had to be cut up into little pieces because to try and take the bed which is about 10 feet long and about 10 inches deep uh, to take it down the stairwell and uh, there would be no stairwell it would fall down so you had to take it in little pieces uh, two by two uh, but we saved one prayer uh, one press and we've used it for artwork it, it can be used by artists it was a very very sophisticated press uh, it, you had to have that roller kissing the the uh, uh, letter press underneath it or it might have been copper uh, and, and and just had to kiss it just right uh, and uh, to do that they had a, a thermofax machine which would give you a height difference so that you could tell where there were any uh, glitches and once again you had journeymen that were mostly men that were able to uh, make sure that this was a uh, printing that was uh, suitable for medical illustration later so that was converted to a rotogravure, and uh, so that was a different industry. You didn't have the linotype anymore, and you you did things photographically. And then later again, there was a digital age. Two oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> I, I uh, so it rolls around quickly. Uh, so anyway. Market Street is in uh, in change. It's getting gentrified, and Weft will be a part of it, and so will areas next door and Heartland Pathways, and so will uh, the uh, sound studio uh, on the uh, Taylor Street and uh, and the. Uh, restaurant which is seven saints to the south and we'll have a, a new event and so keep your eye on it and uh, uh, we'll be back with more information we're sad to lose the, the prairie some of you may want to help us uh, extricate some of the plants some of them will have 10 and 12 feet roots so they don't move easily so we we're wondering how we uh, interest lock with the uh, new tenants. But, yeah. How long do people have when they can still go and visit it before? We don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. it, it probably means, uh, I, I don't think there's going to be too much development in cold weather. So we'll, we will, we'll maybe have, a couple of months even. Weeks uh, for sure though. Uh, I, I, I'm not even sure about that. Oh. It, it, when you have a lease like that, the, the leases need to take over. So uh, it might be immediate. We'll let you know what's going on. It's been a rather, rather wonderful experience. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, but take a take a short look at the prairie before it goes if you get a chance. Just take a walk around the uh, the corridor. Yeah, it's a little stairwell that is not so good in in slippery snow, but uh, otherwise you can enjoy it. And this has been Dave Monk, the Prairie Monk, WEFT Champagne 90.1 on your FM dial. -in. And Dave on the board, and it is now noon. And let's see, uh, the views and opinions expressed are solely those of the speakers and no one else.